One of the perks that I uh, get to being a pastor is I have the opportunity to stand at the front of a church or it might be in a guarding setting. And I get to stand with a starry-eyed couple and watch as the most joyful, nerve-wracking, and expensive event in their life unfolds before me, you know? They're surrounded by friends and family. There's an outpouring of gifts and love. Everywhere you look, tears of happiness because they're giving themselves to each other for the rest of their lives. But what happens when that forever doesn't last forever? My friends, it's a very diff different scene when a lawyer pronounces the end of a marriage. There are no pictures, no toasts, no gifts, no dancing, no ring bearers bringing emblems that unite, just attorneys armed with evidence that divides. There's no happy crowd ready to celebrate, just one or two friends waiting supportively outside. Today we're coming to our series of messages, the end of our series of messages called Intimacy Squared. We've been talking about what the Bible says about sex and about relationships, and we've seen the truth in the Bible about God's boundaries, God's expectations for His children. But today we also need to remember the message of grace and God's love for us, His mercy, and that, uh, yeah, we've tried to tackle some of these very difficult issues in our society. And today we're going to tackle maybe one of the hardest ones of all. We're going to talk about divorce in the church. The reality that marriages in the church, just as in society, are coming to an end around us. And it's difficult to uphold grace and truth, and I need your prayers to do so. So would you pray for me right now, and could we just pray together as we ask the Lord to open up His Word to us? So Heavenly Father, as we just think about this topic that in, involves just equal measures of truth and grace, we pray, Lord, that we would embrace what Your Word says. Help us, Lord, to walk that fine line, that narrow road that Jesus gave us. We pray, Father, that we would have the courage to discuss this honestly but lovingly, and I pray, Lord, that anything that I say, that your Holy Spirit will interpret it the right way for the ears that are listening, that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to your church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it's a tough topic to address in front of a church because there are going to be single people who are here as I'm talking about divorce, and they're going to say, why do I need to be here for this? And I would just implore you singles that you do need to be here so that you can help and support your married friends. But there are also going to be married people who are listening to me today, and you're going to be saying, what do I even need to hear this? I don't even want to think about it, you know? I, I want to be married. I don't want to think about divorce. But the facts are that marriage is challenging for all of us, even at the best of times. And we need to constantly invest in our marriage if we want it to last for the long haul. But of most concern to me today are those who might even be right now thinking about going and being divorced, thinking or, or maybe for those who have been divorced, my big cons concern is that they may be thinking, well, I feel bad about it already. Without the pastor even talking about it, I already feel bad. And my prayer is that my message will be a source of both truth and grace, a message of encouragement and healing for your broken heart. Ignoring our pain doesn't make it go away. So I want to have an ominous conversation today so that we can begin afresh with the Lord in charge. So I'm going to talk, talk about this topic, and we're going to address it from three angles. I'm going to ask three important questions about divorce today in society. First question is for those who are maybe going through a difficult season in their marriage. And if you're here and you're thinking, maybe I should consider being divorced, I want you to stop for a moment as we ask the question, what's the price of divorce? Then the second question is for the benefit of those who really want to make their marriage work, married people. And I want to ask the question, how can we build strong, lasting marriages? No. And then finally, the last question is for those who maybe are going through an unwanted divorce or for those who have experienced a breakup in their marriage in the past. And I want to ask the question, how can you heal after a divorce? So we're going to look at those three questions. And if this last question is kind of where you're at, I hope that what I say this morning will help to heal your broken heart. It saddens me to think that there are divorced people in our churches that feel like second-class citizens, feel like they're beyond grace. When they come to church, 
And I just pray that today, I pray that what I say will not make you feel that way. My prayer is that you will sense the loving embrace of your Father and that you'll hear His voice in your heart saying that He loves you and He wants you to draw near to Him. Now, there's a portion of the Bible that I want to read to you right off the bat. It's an important portion in 1 Corinthians 7. It's a strongly worded couple of verses. This is the truth side of the equation. And we need to understand that God loves us and God is good. And He wants the best for us. And so He gives us specific instructions on how to live a life of love in Him. The Apostle Paul writes, Now for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. So Paul is, you know, specifically directing us to who it is that he's getting this from. All right? This is from God. He says, a wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else go back to him. And the husband must not leave his wife. Now, in the Corinthian church here, there were a lot of people who were kind of confused about how to put their newfound faith together with their marriage. There were a group of people who were saying, well, now I've become a Christian. I've got a brand new life. I'm a new creation Maybe I need a new wife. Maybe I need a new husband, right? Maybe a new life in Christ goes together with a new husband or a new spouse. And so the Apostle Paul has to remind them that God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And when God makes a promise, He faithfully keeps that promise. And He wants His children to be the same way, to keep the promises that they've made, especially our wedding vows. Now, as having said that, I need to acknowledge that there are some cases where it's not always possible for a couple to stay together. There are even cases where biblically divorce, and I would suggest remarriage then, would be allowed. But I want to stress that these are serious situations, such as where there's a pattern of sexual unfaithfulness, or if one spouse totally abandons the relationship and leaves, or I would also suggest that if there's very violent and abusive situations where safety is a concern over time as well. But if you're here today and you're thinking of hitting the exit in your marriage, and you're considering leaving your spouse because you can't, just can't get along and you don't have biblical justification, I, just, I want you to hear the very clear command that God gives you here. Because He loves you, He says a wife must not leave her husband. He says, and the husband must not leave his wife. And so now that we understand the high value that God places on marriages, the first question then that we need to ask is simply, what is the price then of marital breakup? You know, some people are eager to end their marriage. They don't stop to consider what's waiting for them on the other side of that divorce. And if you've never experienced divorce, you may have these wonderful illusions about how great it'll be. You'll be able to get a fresh start. But if you talk to those who've been there, those who've done that, they're going to say, there's a huge price to pay that you don't even understand. Some of those even in our, own, in our own church family have pleaded with me to warn the congregation, to warn married people, don't go there, don't do what I did. I've had people who I've warned not to get divorced and who on the other side of it said, I wish I'd taken your advice. Please, please warn others not to do what I've done. On a very practical note, there's an economic price tag. You see, when a marriage ends, it's estimated that over a third more income is going to be necessary then for that couple to break even. Even if the income is fairly divided evenly between husband and wife, the standard of living for a family will drop an average of 25% at least. Legal fees alone will run you into the tens of thousands. The cost of splitting your property and maintaining two homes and paying for child support and child care, it just gets expensive beyond your wildest imaginations. The cost of divorce comes straight out of the bank accounts of mostly women and kids. Now, I know it's tough on guys too, but the average mother and child who are not poor prior to divorce will suffer a 50% drop in income on average. Secondly, divorce comes with an emotional price tag. There was an extensive study that looked at the psychological health of men and women who were married and then divorced, and the re results were shocking. People who were divorced experienced a substantial deterioration in mental and emotional well-being. There was a lot more depression, 
a lot less personal achievement, a lot less of a sense of your purpose in life, and less self-acceptance. There's an emotional price tag that hits children extremely hard. Uh, 30 or 40 years ago, our nation embarked on this experiment called no-fault divorce. And experts said, don't worry, it'll be okay. Families will get over it. Kids will be all right. We'll make it easier for families to split up and children will be happier. Well, we know now that that experiment is an utter failure. Children who go through divorce are seven times more likely to struggle with depression. They have much higher levels of behavioral problems, more problems with drugs, with crime, more likely to be poor. The list could go on and on, but all you have to do is just ask a teacher in this room. And they'll tell you straight up. There's a high emotional price the kids are paying in our society. And the third thing before considering divorce is for you to consider the relational price tag. Divorce turns partners into courtroom opponents. It divides children against parents. It separates brothers and sisters. It pits friends against friends. Couples and families that you used to hang out with, they still love you, but it's awkward. It's not the same as it used to be. A fourth thing that's often overlooked is that divorce comes with a medical price tag. Yes, that's right. I said that right. Medical. Years, a few years ago, there was an extensive study that found that it was as dangerous for a middle-aged man's health to pick up a pack-a-day cigarette habit as it is to get divorced. Let me say that again. Studies show that for your average man, it would be more healthy for him to pick up a pack-a-day cigarette habit than to get divorced. It's just one study in a growing body of research that conveys the message that divorce should come with a medical label warning. Leaving your spouse can be hazardous to your health. It's an interesting stat. Nine out of ten married men alive at my age, okay, nine out of ten married men alive at my age will be still alive at the age of 65. It's good news. I feel like pretty good about those stats. But um, by contrast, six out of ten divorced men who are alive at my age will be dead. Sorry, six out of ten, sorry, will make it to 65. So that's a one-third difference. Do you see that? If you want a detailed explanation of the reasons behind these facts, because there are reasons, you can pick up the book, The Case for Marriage, by Linda Waite and Maggie Gallagher, okay? But it's pretty scary when you look at the facts. And finally, let's not forget there's a spiritual price tag. As I've said a number of times in the series, we don't expect that non-Christians are going to follow the commands of the Bible. But if you're a follower of Christ... And if you're thinking about leaving your spouse, and if you don't have biblical reasons for doing so, there's a huge spiritual price tag to pay. A, a, a price tag for willingly disobeying God. Listen to what God says about divorce in Malachi 2. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. It's as cruel as putting on a victim's blood-stained coat. So guard yourself and remain loyal to your wife. These are strong words. God says that he hates divorce. Please note, he's not saying that he hates divorced people. He says that he hates the act of divorce because it causes hurt and devastation. And when we leave our spouse for our own selfish reasons, God still loves us. But instead of moving toward intimacy with him, we begin to move away from his loving embrace. So now that we've looked honestly at the high price tag that comes with divorce, let's turn a corner now and let's investigate what are some of the biblical truths that will help to make our marriages more healthy. Let's ask the question, how can we build forever marriages? If you're here today and you're talking about or, or um, you're considering divorce, I just want to ask you a question. I want to ask you this question. What if you were to take just some of the economic, emotional, relational, medical, spiritual energy that you were thinking about putting into a divorce, and what if you were to invest all of that same energy into making your marriage strong and healthy? Isn't that a great question? Doesn't that just make more sense? So many couples, they say, you know what? My marriage has been tried and found wanting. And I want to say to them, no, 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 I think it hasn't been tried. Let's work on it. Psychologist Dr. John Gottman has done some groundbreaking research on marriage. And over the last few decades, he claims that he's able now to predict with a 91% accuracy rate whether a couple will stay together and which one will get divorced based upon four factors. 
And all of these four factors are discussed and emphasized in the scriptures. So this is nothing new. First of all, healthy marriages are going to be characterized by honor instead of disdain. When couples show disdain or contempt for each other, this is a sign that the relationship is in serious trouble. We need to be so careful that we don't use put-downs, that we don't employ cutting sarcasm, that we do not sneer at our spouse. You know what the worst thing is? Rolling your eyes. Rolling your eyes at your spouse is poisonous in a marriage. So much so that when Dr. Gottman sees a couple express contempt, he knows the marriage is headed for huge trouble. Listen to God's instructions in Romans 12.10. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Man, what if you were to take the energy that you might have put into your divorce and you expend that in an effort to outdo your spouse in honoring them and taking delight in them, as the Bible says, showing respect. Here's what I want you to do. Go home today and make a list of the three things that you admire most about your spouse and then give it to them later today, okay? Now, I know I said that I'm suggesting that, but I'm, I'm not just suggesting it. I'm telling you, do it. I mean it. Go home, write out three things, if you're married, three things that you adore and delight in about your spouse, and then give it to them. All right, I'm just suggesting it, but still, do it. Now, when your spouse walks into the room, show them that you're glad to see them. Go out for a coffee with your mate. Reminisce about the good times in your relationship this week. Remember the things that first attracted you to them. Dr. Gottman has in his book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, he has pages and pages of ideas for nurturing your fondness and affection for your spouse. Second thing to do is to encourage instead of criticize. A chronic critical spirit will destroy a marriage. Some couples, unfortunately, will only fixate on the negative things in their spouse, the things negatively that they did, and they will ignore the dozens and hundreds of little good things that they do every day. And the point is, is that you're always going to find things to complain about, but remember, there's a huge difference between complaint and criticism. Complaints are okay. A complaint will attack the specific action at which your spouse did or didn't do. But a criticism adds something extra. A criticism will have negative words about their character or their personality. Let me give you an example. A complaint is saying, I'm really angry that you didn't take out the garbage today. That's honest. That's a complaint. Okay. A criticism is saying, why are you always so forgetful? I hate how you don't care about me. See, that's starting to get into character and personality. A complaint says, I don't like what you did or didn't do. A criticism says, you know, I'm not even really sure if I like you. Again, the Bible has an antidote for a critical spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, so encourage each other and build each other up. Married friends, what if... All we did as a result of this message was went home and did that verse seriously for one week. I mean, that would be worth the price of admission alone for this sermon, right? Encourage one another and build each other up. Wouldn't that be an amazing week that you'd have if you went home and just took that to heart and did it? In marriage, this means applauding what's good about your mate, not just picking on the things they did wrong. It means cheering them in their victories and walking with them through their defeats. So the question I want to ask is, what would your spouse say? Are you an encourager? Have you told your spouse recently what you enjoy about them? Have you told them that if you had to do it all over again, you you would choose them? Do you encourage? Another factor in building forever marriages is openness instead of defensiveness. And this is all about what happens when your spouse comes to you and mentions a complaint. What happens when they point out something that you did or didn't do right? Do you go on the defensive? Do you lash out in anger? Do you come up with stuff that they didn't do right? Or do you accept it? See, it's always 
tempting for us to come up with a list of reasons for why, in my case, it was okay to be lazy or impatient or insensitive or critical. What's the typical reaction of a complaint in my heart? The Bible says to be open about your shortcomings, to be less reactive, to slow down and listen to the concerns. James 1.19 says, Dear brothers and sisters, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. One of the characteristics of couples that have healthy marriages is that they're just willing to listen, however difficult, and admit their shortcomings. A final thing to keep in mind for building a healthy marriage is connection instead of withdrawal. For years it was assumed that conflict was a terrible thing in marriage, but one of the most surprising findings by Dr. Gottman's research is that fighting is not a huge predictor of divorce. Let me say that again. Fighting or conflict is not a huge predictor of divorce. Some of the healthiest marriages have medium to even medium high levels of conflict. You can have lots of disagreements and still have a strong marriage. Here's what poses a far greater risk to marriage than fighting. Becoming detached. Withdrawing emotionally is a massive indication that the marriage is in trouble. Listen to what the Bible says about Philippians in Philippians 2. Are your hearts tender and sympathetic? Oh, this is a, such a critical ingredient for a healthy marriage. It's a heart that's tender and sympathetic toward the other person. And then it says, If so, make me happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another. And how do you do that? Working together with one heart and purpose. Moving toward each other and working on the relationship. And this is often done in the mundane issues of life. So many of us think, well, I can't put my marriage back together because we can't do that big vacation on the lake, or we don't have time to, you know, or the money to have an expensive candlelight dinner every week, so we can't do it. But what you need to understand is that red-hot romance is created by making small, little deposits in your spouse's emotional bank account on a regular basis. It's when you check in for five minutes in the middle of the day and say hi. It's when you connect on the couch after a long day of work. It's when you fold laundry together. It's when you rake the lawn together. We need to get this straight. It's about the small stuff that counts. Now, if there are any of these four issues that are a problem for you, I suggest that you don't just slide toward divorce without addressing these things. Don't just ignore your problems. Don't sweep stuff under the carpet because it doesn't go away. If your marriage is in trouble, put your hand up. Ask for help. See a counselor. Talk to your pastor. The choice is yours. You can pay a small price now or a huge price later. And singles, please encourage your married friends to get help and not to jump ship. So now that we've established a high price tag of divorce, and now that we've walked through some of the steps that you would take to create a healthier marriage, let's take the remainder of our time together and talk just about this question. How can you heal after a divorce? You know, there are going to be times in our life where our best efforts fall short. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 tells us, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. That verse there says, as far as it depends upon you, because sometimes our best efforts fall short. Sometimes people make every effort to repair a marriage, and the other person still exercises their choice and walks away. It's heartbreaking. And if your spouse is determined to leave you, it does not just depend on what you want. If you're going through a divorce, or if you've gone through a divorce, I want to extend God's love to you. I want to share with you some basic biblical principles that I think will help you to find healing. And first, God says for you to, first of all, embrace your weakness. This is a lesson that God is going to teach every Christ follower at some point in your life. God is going to allow something to come into your life, sometimes very painful things. And when you're weak and you turn to Christ in that moment, then you can receive a supernatural source of strength. The Apostle Paul went through a difficult time in his life. We don't know what this thorn in the flesh was, but it says in 2 Corinthians three times, he said, I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said to me, 
Isn't it wonderful that the Lord just keeps on coming back at us with the same message? He just keeps on talking to us. Sometimes we're not listening, but he just three times each time, he said what? My gracious favor, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I'm glad, he says, to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may work through me. When you feel weak, weak maybe because of a broken marriage, when it seems that there's nothing worth living for, it forces you to your knees in prayers and humility, and then something wonderful can take place. Talk to so many people who've said that, you know, before my divorce, my relationship with Jesus was very distant. I allowed myself to coast. I wasn't really praying. I wasn't really transformed by the Holy Spirit. And it forced me to my knees like nothing else. When you're emptied of your reliance on your own strength, you're in a position where you can receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to change, the power to move forward. But if in response to this weakness, you say, I'm going to handle it myself. I don't need God's help. Then you're not going to have access to that strength of God's power that works best in weakness So embrace your weakness if you're there. Come to him and receive his strength. Secondly, I suggest admit any wrongdoing. Own your stuff. Admit your mistakes. 1 John 1, 8 reminds us, it says, if we have no sin, if we say we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. Now, please understand, I I know that there are some people who have been faithful in their marriage and they have an unfaithful partner. And I would never suggest that everyone is equally responsible when a couple splits up. But if there was something that you did that contributed to unhealth in your marriage, it's important that you own up to that, whatever it may be, so that you don't make the same mistakes moving forward. Every marriage, after all, is made up of two sinful, imperfect people. And it's best to just acknowledge that. For example, I know that I'm a sinful, imperfect, stubborn person person. And my wife, Krista, is married to a sinful, imperfect, and stubborn person. That's what she told me to say. (laughs) That's what she tells me. No, it's, it's true. Marriage can be painful at the best of times. And your ex spouse may have done some terrible things or said some awful things to you. And they, in fact, may be the one who's 100% responsible that your divorce took place. But for you to receive healing, you're going to have to come in humility and admit that there were some things that you also did wrong. Thirdly, to heal from a divorce, do what is right. Do the right thing. I remember I got a call from a friend of mine from Bible college. This was a couple of years after Bible college. (coughs) And he poured out his heart to me. His wife had a number of affairs and was living with another man. And he had been completely faithful to her, and he was utterly heartbroken, and I was heartbroken for him. One of the things, though, that I just sensed the Lord was telling me to say that during that day was just to be really blunt, and I said to him, Skip, I said, no matter what she does, make sure at the end of the day that you can hold your head up high. I said, no matter what she does, do the right thing. Don't try to go out and cheat on her to get her back. Don't try to go out and get, use this as an excuse to get drunk. I, I just said, I want to remind you, Skip. I said, you are a married man. And I said, you must not move on and start to date someone else. Even if she's moved on, even if she's seeing somebody else, I said, you must still remember that you're a married man. Man, I said, do, you do not have the freedom to date another woman at this time. Be faithful to your wedding vows. And I stress that. And I said, if your marriage one day is someday over, I hope it won't be. But I said, you may find yourself at the front of the church someday making vows to another woman. And I said, you need to do the right thing so that you can say with total honesty, I honored my previous vows. And years later, when his divorce was long over and he did marry someone else. My friend came out into the foyer of the church after the wedding ceremony. He looked into my eyes and he said, Steve, I want to tell you something. I'm so glad that you challenged me to be faithful during that difficult time. That was a lifesaver. Thanks for telling me the truth. So I suggest to you, please, no matter how hard it may be, do the right thing. 
Psalm 34, 15 tells us the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. God will honor you if you do the right thing in a difficult time. Fourthly, to recover from divorce, the Bible tells us to forgive. How many times? Again and again and again and again. Forgiveness, as you know, is so hard. But it's not a feeling, it's a choice. And if you're going to find healing from a divorce, you're going to have to let go of your desire to retaliate. I heard about a, an advertisement that appeared in a newspaper in the United States in the late 90s. And this advertisement read, For sale, 1995 Mercedes, 500 SL loaded, first 50 bucks takes it. The guy reading this in the newspaper couldn't believe his eyes, and he called up the phone number that was listed thought, it must be a misprint. You must be missing three zeros. The woman who answered him assured him, I'm not kidding. I am, in fact, selling this 700, uh, sorry, 70,000, sorry, $70,000 automobile for 50 bucks. So what did he do? Rushed over as fast as he could, gave her a check. She handed him the title to the Mercedes. And as he was getting into the car, he said, why are you selling this car for $50? And she said, well, my husband just left me for his secretary. And the judge said I had to sell the Mercedes and give him half the money. (laughs) And this is it. It's human, isn't it? For us to want to retaliate, to seek revenge. Sometimes we even lie awake at night, don't we? Thinking of ways to get even. And we're counseled by friends and attorneys to sock it to them, but in reality, it's not helpful for us to counsel our friends. Oh, you're better off without that jerk. Because that person needs to learn to forgive. And let go into God's hands. So forgive frequently. Jesus, when he was talking to Peter in Matthew 18, Peter said, Lord, how often should I forgive somebody who sins against me? Seven times? And then I cut him off? No, Jesus replied. Seventy times seven. Jesus is saying, there are going to be some times where you're going to have to forgive the same person over and over. And there are going to be other times, he says, where I think you're going to have to forgive somebody the same for the same offense multiple, multiple times. Every time you remember those feelings and they come flooding back, forgive again to give those feelings of anger and disappointment to God. And you can dissolve the poison of resentment in your heart that will do so much damage to you, but only through the choice of forgiveness. So there it is. The fifth and most important thing that I can share with you to heal after divorce is to cast your cares upon God. Run to God. 1 Peter 5, 7 says it so well. Give all your worries and cares to God for He cares about what happens to you. God is good. He's a good, good father. He knows what you're going through. And you're you're never closer to God than when you're crushed and broken and you give your worries and your cares into his hands. He's right there with his hand reaching out. If you'll just take his hand, he'll walk you through this. Now, today is Palm Sunday, and this has not, I know, been your typical Palm Sunday message. But I want to remind you what Jesus said, what took place as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem on that original Palm Sunday. The people were welcoming him, and they were throwing their cloaks, and they were laying down palm branches and waving them. Why? Because they were welcoming Jesus into their city. But there was a group of people who didn't welcome Jesus. Do you know who they were? The Pharisees. The religiously proud. Those who thought they had it together. I'm not a sinner. I've never been divorced. I've never committed adultery. I've never committed fornication. I'm pretty good. It was the Pharisees who refused to welcome Jesus. And Gateway family, I think... I think we got a choice. We can pretend to have it all together like the Pharisees, pretend that we don't have any sin, or we can be like the people and welcome Jesus into our brokenness. Let me remind you that God longs for his church to be a healing community, a real place where real people with real hurts can find a real God. We don't need to pretend like the Pharisees that we got it all together and that we're perfect. We don't need to be plastic people with plastic smiles and plastic platitudes for complex issues. God wants his church to be a place that offers acceptance for those who didn't want to go through a divorce, but it was foisted upon them anyway. God wants his church to be a place that offers forgiveness and accountability for those who shoulder the responsibility for the breakdown of their marriage. 
God wants his church to be a safe place of grace where everybody who comes to Jesus with the, mess, the messiness of their sexuality and the brokenness of their relationships can receive an opportunity to move forward with God and to make a contribution to the church and in the lives of others. I want to wrap up this series by sharing with you one of my favorite stories. Jackie Robinson did a very courageous thing and broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball many years ago. And everywhere he went, he was enduring racial slurs, harassment, and booze. One day in Brooklyn, on his own home field, Jackie Robinson made a critical error that cost the Dodgers the game. And his own fans began to boo him and throw racial slurs at him from the stands. And Jackie Robinson stood on second base, the object of all this ridicule, all alone, feeling like a total failure. But one of his teammates, by the name of Pee Wee Reese, came over and stood beside him and put his arm around Jackie Robinson as the crowd quieted down. And Jackie Robinson later said, that arm around my shoulder saved my career. Friends, my dream is that we're going to be a church that is filled with truth and grace, a grace, gracious church. And those who are going through these challenging issues that we've identified in this series, that we're going to put our arm around singles, and we're going to say, you matter, you're important, and you're valuable to me. I'm asking you to put your arm around those who've made mistakes in the area of sexuality and marriage, and say, as, we've all, as we all need to say, to say we, we understand, I've been there. This is a place of healing through God's grace. And if we're married, I pray that we're going to put our arm around our spouse today at some time and say, with God's help, we're going to build a strong foundation for our marriage. And I'm not giving up on you. Gateway, let's be that kind of church that puts their arm around people. Where there's an absence of arrogant, pharisaical hearts and judgmental spirits. Where there's grace and truth that is given to broken hearts to build up marriages, and to glorify God. So I'm going to ask that Lindsay and the worship band would come at this time and lead us in a worship song as we think about the goodness and the forgiveness of God. Let me pray. And why don't you stand? Can we all stand together? So Lord, we just want to celebrate that you are a good, good father. You're so good that you give us your loving boundaries. And you tell us the honest truth about how to live in a way that would honor and please you. How to live in a way, Lord, that would encourage us to flourish as human beings, both now and forevermore. We thank you for your truth. Father, we also thank you so much for your grace. Knowing that we're frail, knowing that we fail, you put your arms around us. And you stretched out your arms and you died on the cross as we're about to, to remember on Good Friday. And you said, I died for those sins. Leave them with me. And I pray, Father, that we would be a church then that wouldn't hesitate to put our arms around people, broken people, and give them the truth and grace that you've given us. And if you agree, then let's all say it together. All God's people said, amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord together.